The story discussed in this video began in the distant year of 1984. The criminal did everything possible to ensure that the police could not only track him down, but also even identify the victim. It turned out that in the region where the crime occurred, there were at least two world-famous serial killers active at the time, responsible for about 100 lives taken, as well as at least one other terrible person living there. Many missing persons were considered as potential victims of this murder. However, only after 38 years, on March 29, 2023, it was announced who the famous Spokane Jane Doe, also known as Millie, really was. Subscribe to this channel and don't forget to click the bell to get notifications about new videos. Spokane, Washington, June 20th, 1984. Near Spokane Falls Community College and TJ Meenak Bridge, in the waters of the Spokane River, local fishermen discovered a body. When the police arrived, they encountered a horrifying scene. The deceased was missing head and parts of her limbs. County Medical Examiner Sally Aiken was called to the scene. She determined that the death had most likely occurred within the last 48 hours, but noted that since the water temperature in the river was only 48 degrees Fahrenheit at the time, the body could have been preserved much better, meaning it could have been in the river for longer. In the end, Aiken changed her initial opinion and indicated that the death could have occurred anywhere from several days to several weeks before the victim was found. The expert determined that the woman had been raped and assaulted with a blunt object, causing damage to her internal organs, as evidenced by characteristic injuries and bruises. A piece of tape was found on one of her hands. Death was caused by a combination of beating and stab wounds. Investigators immediately realized that the investigation of this case would not be easy, so an experienced forensic pathologist from King County was invited to perform the autopsy. In his report, he noted distinctive features such as scars on each knee, a scar on the left bicep, and two moles on the front of the neck. The body had light-colored hair, leading to the assumption that the woman was blonde. At that time, a theory emerged that the victim might have had Scandinavian roots. The person's height was estimated to be around 5 feet 7 inches, and the weight around 30 pounds. The forensic pathologist initially estimated the woman to be between 30 and 40 years old, but the age range was later changed to 25, 35 years old. The specialist also determined that she had given birth at least once. When investigators' attempts to find relatives or acquaintances of the victim in the area where she was found did not yield any positive results, they concluded that the woman was either a visitor or her body had been brought to Spokane by the perpetrator. It was also believed that the victim likely knew her killer, as the perpetrator had deliberately removed her limbs to hinder the identification process. Furthermore, experts concluded that this murder was not the first for the perpetrator, as dismemberment rarely occurs in a first-time crime. An unexpected twist in the investigation occurred, when, just a few days after the discovery of Jane Doe, another girl who had been murdered was found in the area, not far from the river. Debbie Finner. By 1984, Debbie was 30 years old, and shortly before that, she had moved to Spokane from Omaha, where her family lived. Debbie's brother, Stephen, who was three years younger, believes that his sister did not leave voluntarily. She just didn't seem to me as the type that would uproot on her own. She didn't have a lot of money, and I don't think at that time she had a car, Stephen recalled. The woman also had a son named Troy Bennett, Debbie's lifeless body was found near railway cars, near 1800 East Trent Avenue, close to the Spokane River. According to the expert's report, she had sustained at least eight injuries, and defensive wounds were also found on her hands and wrists. It was evident that the girl had fought for her life. No stimulants were found in the victim's system, except for caffeine. It was noted that she had had sexual contact shortly before her death. She was found clothed, but without underwear. It is unknown whether the underwear was removed by the killer or if it was initially absent, as in a newspaper article dedicated to Debbie, she is referred to as a prostitute. It was quickly discovered that the police had seen Finnern a few hours before her death in the area and had warned her that it was a dangerous place and that she should go home. However, the girl did not heed their advice, which likely cost her her life. As it turned out, many years later, 
both Debbie Finnern and Spokane's Jane Doe, were extremely unlucky to be in a location where several notorious serial killers were active at the time. Rimrock, a suburb of Spokane. A month after the incident, a local resident's dog brought home a human hand. It was immediately sent for fingerprint analysis and other examinations to FBI specialists in Washington, D.C. However, as sometimes happens during investigations, at some point, the hand was lost. Nevertheless, the material taken from it was sufficient to conduct a mitochondrial DNA analysis. The analysis did not confirm a connection between the hand and Millie's body. Due to the negligence of either the police or the FBI, it is now impossible to use modern methods to identify the person to whom the limb belonged. This once promising lead led to nothing, and for many years, there were no significant developments in the case. Only 14 years after the incident, on April 19, 1998, around 7 p.m., a local resident of Spokane was walking her dog near an abandoned lot at the corner of 7th and Sherman Streets. At some point, the woman's attention was drawn to something resembling human remains, located among the trash at the bottom of a pit. The arriving police officers cordoned off the discovery site and thoroughly investigated the area. It turned out that, in addition to the skull seen by the witness, there were other bones in the pit. The plot of land where the skull was found had previously been part of the Sharon Temple, a Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, which was demolished in 1989 after being vacant for several years. When the church was destroyed, the land became overgrown and a favorite play area for local children. The northern part of the plot was heavily overgrown and a wooden playhouse and swings had even been set up there. The entire area was cleared by volunteers very infrequently, about once every few years. The last time it had been cleared was half a year before the discovery of the remains. Initially, investigators did not rule out the possibility that there might have been a cemetery on the church grounds and the remains had been resting in one of the graves. However, the murder theory was considered a priority given that by that time, several local women had already been killed. Law enforcement officers hypothesized that the skull could belong to the body of Jane Doe, found 14 years earlier. Along with the skull, several vertebrae were also found. Although by that time, everyone who had worked on the case had retired, medical examiner George Lindholm was able to determine from the records that the nature of the wounds on the victim's neck and the found vertebrae were identical. Eventually, on March 9, 2000, a facial reconstruction of the deceased girl was created. Later, in order to conduct a DNA analysis, the unidentified body was exhumed from the local Fairmount Cemetery. To carry out the necessary research, the skull had to be taken to anthropologists in western Washington. This task was assigned to Detective Don Giza, who took his fifth-grade daughter with him on the trip. Along the way, they stopped at a motel, and the girl said that they should somehow name the person who was in the same room with them. Let's call her Millie, the girl suggested. From then on, Spokane Jane Doe became also known as Millie. In the end, the DNA analysis confirmed that the skull belonged to the girl killed in 1984. At that time, a forensic dentist examined Millie's skull again and determined that she had received dental care shortly before her death. In addition, details such as a large gap between her upper front teeth and an overbite, where the lower teeth protrude further than the upper teeth, were added to the girl's description. The analysis results were then entered into both Washington State Patrol's missing and unidentified persons database and the National Crime Information Center. Furthermore, due to the proximity of the Canadian border, the FBI shared the obtained results with law enforcement agencies in Canada. However, all these efforts, like many previous ones, led to no results. However, the DNA analysis did give a boost to the investigation. In 2004, police from Australia contacted the investigators. It turned out that a woman from New South Wales suspected that the deceased in Spokane could be her daughter. Her words were so convincing that they even conducted a DNA comparison. However, no match was found. Two years later, the victim's hand tape was sent for examination, hoping to find the killer's biological traces on it. But this also did not yield any results. A year later, forensic artist Carl Koppelman created a new version of the deceased's appearance. It was published by the local newspaper, 
Spokesman Review By 2007, Millie was the only unidentified woman in Spokane County. For eight years, there was no progress in the investigation until 2015, when amateur detectives, trying to determine the identity of the murdered girl, noticed a missing girl from many years ago whose appearance closely resembled the description of Spokane's Jane Doe. Sheila Annette Polly, State of California, Blythe. It's located right on the border with Arizona. A 20-year-old girl named Sheila Polly lived there. She regularly spent time at a bar called Charlie's Chuck House, which is located in Ehrenberg, a couple of miles from her home but in Arizona Territory. On one of those usual days, September 1, 1980, Sheila left the establishment and was followed by several members of a local motorcycle gang. She has never been heard from again. The missing girl was described as a slim blonde with a birthmark on her nose and moles on her neck. She was dressed in blue jeans and a black-red flannel button-up shirt. By the age of 20, the girl was already a mother, and her little son was waiting for her at home in Blythe. For 35 years, attempts to find Sheila led to nothing. But with the advent of new technologies, the investigation of this case received a new impetus. After some concerned individuals noticed the resemblance between Sheila and Spokane Jane Doe, the investigators grasped at this lead. Spokane is a 20-hour drive from Ehrenberg, the place where 20-year-old Polly disappeared. But four years had passed, and the girl could have ended up anywhere in the country. To compare DNA materials, Sheila's sister and her now adult son submitted samples for analysis. However, the result was negative. The detective's assumptions were not confirmed. What happened to Polly and whether she is alive remains a mystery to this day. September 2021 as the years went by, science advanced, forensic genealogy gained widespread popularity, and new methods of studying DNA material were developed. Instead of examining the usual 13 to 20 markers in the genome, various types of markers, ranging from 600 to 700, were studied. This allowed for the identification of even very distant relatives when the DNA profile match is only 1%. Therefore, in 2021, Sergeant Zach Stormont of the Spokane Police Department sent the remains of the so-called Millie to be analyzed by the company Othram, which had gained fame in recent years for establishing the identities of numerous individuals. In the end, with the assistance of the Spokane County Clerk and the Washington State Department of Health, detectives were able to find a divorce record that listed two sisters. The genealogical investigation showed that only these two women could be Spokane Jane Doe. However, it was unknown which of them was the victim, and both were listed as deceased. Nevertheless, Nicole Hamada from the Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office found the younger sister alive in the Midwest. The woman agreed to participate in the investigation and provided the necessary DNA sample. Thus, on February 17, 2023, it was revealed that the unidentified body found in the Spokane River belonged to Ruth Bell Waymeyer. Ruth was born on April 16, 1960, so she was 24 years old at the time of her murder. She graduated from Rogers High School, likely in Puyallup, Washington. When she was a child, her parents divorced, and her mother moved with Ruth and her sister to live with relatives in Spokane. However, their mother soon passed away, and the sisters went their separate ways and lost contact. It was believed that Waymire led a transient lifestyle that's why none of her relatives considered her missing. It is known that Ruth was married twice. Her first husband is still alive, living in Spokane, and cooperating with the investigation. Her second husband was Trampus David Lee Vaughn, who was 15 years older than her. Born in Iowa, where he served time in prison before marrying Ruth on June 8, 1981, in Wenatchee, Washington. Suspects since Ruth Waymire's body was found not far from where Debbie Finnern was discovered just a few days later, these murders are always mentioned together. Although the investigation did not see a connection between these women or the methods of their killings, most of the suspects were the same for both cases. One of them was Robert Lee Yates Jr., also known as the Spokane Serial Killer or the Grocery Bag Killer due to his habit of putting bags over his victims' heads. Yates primarily targeted prostitutes, specifically from this region, 
He killed at least 16 people and is suspected in dozens of other murders and rapes. He was arrested only in 2000. Another suspect considered was Gary Ridgway, known as the Green River Killer. Like Yates, he also killed prostitutes and lived in Washington State, not far from where Finnern and Wymere were found. Almost all of his crimes were committed between 1982 and 1985. It is believed that he may have killed over 90 people. The third suspect, quite unexpectedly, became local resident Carl Giesa, and here is why. In August 1985, a 12-year-old girl named Marcy Belex was killed in Spokane. The day before, she had bought a new dress with her pocket money, which her father did not like, and he made several hurtful comments to the girl. As a result, the child ran away from home. Two days later, her lifeless body was found at a towing yard. Marcy had been raped, and her throat was slit, with 29 knife wounds inflicted only to her chest. The only piece of evidence found at the crime scene was a leather sheath for a double-edged 5-inch Gerber knife. The investigation was unable to identify the killer. It was not until 2019 that thanks to the analysis of a swab taken from Marcy's body, a genealogical tree was constructed, which led to a local resident, Clayton Carl Giza. At the time of the girl's murder, he was 21 years old. He died four years later, when he suddenly lost control of his car while swerving around a bend. To comply with all formalities, his body was exhumed and the analysis conducted yielded a 100% match. This man could have committed more than one such brutal murder in that region. Also, considering that Ruth Waymeyer's husband, David Lee Vaughn, never reported her missing, never contacted the police, and had a criminal past, investigators also consider him as a possible killer. However, if that is the case, like Carl Giza, he evaded punishment since he died in 2017 in Sutter County, California. The investigation is ongoing, and the police are also searching for the child or children of the murdered woman. What do you think? Who is responsible for the death of Ruth Waymeyer?